While the conceptual framework probably has the greatest overall impact on the presentation of general purpose financial reports, we need to recognize that the framework is supported by a number of other standards. And I want to talk about the supporting standards now. These standards very much support the framework and a lot of the issues which are addressed in these standards could have been addressed in the framework. I think that the reason why they weren't addressed in the framework is probably technical. Although from an educational perspective, which is where I'm approaching it from, it would be much easier to have addressed them in the framework or at the least to address them concurrently. And that's why I wanna talk about them now. The standards that I'm talking about are IAS1, Presentation of Financial Statements, IS8, Accounting Policies, and IS10, Events After Reporting Period. The first standard I want to talk about now is, double, is IAS1, Presentation of Financial Statements, and this was reissued by the Australian Accounting Standards Board as AASB 101. I also need to acknowledge that it is presently subject to revision and the an exposure draft has been issued, uh, ED 298 by the AASB in January 2020, and I would encourage you to have a look at it. In terms of my thinking here, I would like to draw your attentions to how this might easily have been incorporated into the framework. And one could say that this has contributed, contributed to redundancy or inefficiently, inefficiency, but I would also say that if it had been incorporated, incorporated into the framework, it would have made our lives much easier. And you can sort of, just to highlight that, paragraph nine could just see have been incorporated in paragraph one, the purpose of financial statements. What financial statements compromise could be incorporated in paragraph chapter three. Fair presentation, chapters two and three. Frequency reporting, chapter three. Comparative information, chapter two. Structure and content, chapter three. It's for this reason that I'd argue that it's probably very difficult to consider IAS1 separately or independently from the conceptual framework, rather they should be thought of as part of a more comprehensive and cohesive framework. So having got that out of the way, let's just focus a bit on a bit more of the detail of what's required by IAS1 presentation of financial statements. This very much dictates what financial statements generally look like, a bit like my dog. What are the general features of financial statements? Well, they're required to give a fair presentation and compliance with accounting standards. They're going to, they should be prepared on a going concern basis. They should use accrual accounting basis. Materiality, which is mentioned in the framework, is also mentioned again here. And the circumstances where offsetting is allowed or is not allowed is addressed. The frequency of reporting is identified. The requirement to provide comparative information is identified and consistency is given some preeminence. These are all items which I think supplement what we think about financial reporting, how they're prepared, when they're presented, and a lot of these issues could have been addressed in chapters one, two, and three of the framework, and arguably there is some redundancy across them. In terms of the actual structure or content of general purpose financial reports, the Financial report must clearly identify the financial statements. There is, however, the possibility that firms may report non-GAAP performance measures, and in Australia, these are dictated by RG230 in terms of how they're presented or identified in the financial statements. What this means is that firms can provide an alternative measure of performance. As you can see here, we have one for Qantas. And if they do go down that path, they need to provide a reconciliation of their non-GAAP performance measure to a relevant or appropriate statutory performance measure. So in this case, you can see that Qantas provided a reconciliation of underlying profit before tax, which was their non-GAAP performance measure. And in the notes, they showed the reconciliation to statutory profit before tax. Paragraph 51 also goes through a number of the technical details. IS1 then talks about the statement of uh, financial position. It identifies line items that are required to be dis disclosed in the statement of financial position. It requires a current or non-current classification or something similar. And it prescribes what should be disclosed in the notes, having regard to what appears in the 
statement of financial position. It requires the disclosure of equity and a statement of financial position because of these very strict guidelines very consistently appears like this in the general purpose financial report. Supporting the uh, financial uh, statement of financial position, we have a statement of profit or loss or other comprehensive and other comprehensive income. There is a bit of flexibility here to the extent that paragraph 81a allows the firm to present this as either one statement or two. And what you can see here is for Qantas, they've used a two statement approach. So they present a statement of profit or loss first. And then they provide a second statement on the subsequent page, statement of other uh, comprehensive income. In the statement of profit or loss, firms are required to disclose certain line items in the statement. And there are also requirements for the line items in other comprehensive income. Problematic, there isn't a, problematically, there isn't a theoretical or a conceptual basis for determining what should be disclosed in other comprehensive income or in the PL, but that's pretty much addressed on an ad hoc basis in individual standards. However, there is essentially an all inclusive concept of income prescribed, and all items of revenue and expenses must at some time go through the income statement. Material items should be disclosed, and expenses should be disclosed on either a nature or function basis. There is a preference for nature. And if a functional basis is used, then nature must be disclosed also in the notes. So what you can appreciate here is that when it comes to the statement of profit or loss, once again, it's quite strongly dictated by the form of the regulation. Firms are also required to disclose a statement of changes in equity. Paragraph 106 describes the line items that have to be recognised. And this is what it looks like in the financial statements. The statement of cash flows is, whoops, it's not uh, addressed in AASB1. It's actually not addressed until IAS7. So what we need to see here is that, yes, there is a requirement to present a statement of cash flows. It's referenced in the standard, um, paragraph 111, but the detail is actually provided in IAS7. So I would encourage you to go across to IAS7. And once again, please just appreciate how it outlines what's presented in a cash flow statement how it's presented, where it's presented. There are extensive uh, notes required to support a set of financial statements. The, the note must disclose the basis of preparation, the accounting policies adopted, and any critical assumptions. So that very much dictates the form, how the financial statements are presented. It doesn't so much dictate how the numbers are calculated, and that's going to be addressed in later standards. But there are, however, and there is another accounting standard which is quite important in terms of choosing accounting policies. That's IAS 8, and that's been reissued in the Australian context as AASB 108. Once again, it would have been much easier if a lot of these issues had been addressed in a conceptual framework. It would have made our lives easier. For example, paragraphs 7 and 10, selection of accounting policies, could just as easily have been addressed in paragraphs 1 or 2. We're not going to meet our objective of financial reporting if we don't have accounting practices which are consistent with accounting policies. Or it, alternatively, it could be addressed in Chapter 2, where we talk about the selection of accounting policies being necessary to ensure that the accounting information is relevant. Consistency could have been addressed in Chapter 2. Changes in accounting policies could have been addressed in Chapter 2. Disclosure could have been addressed in Chapter 8, sorry, Chapter 7. So the point I'm making here is that I'd like you to, to when you're reading through AASB 108, IAS 8, I'd like you to reflect upon how this sort of dovetails or interconnects with the conceptual framework and how it could just as easily, easily have been addressed as one. And if you think about them together, I think it's going to give you a much richer appreciation of how the regulation works. So please don't try and consider IS8 separately from the conceptual framework, but consider how it operates in combination. The general requirement of AASB 108 is that when it comes to accounting policies, you should comply with accounting standards. Keep calm, follow the rules. That probably seems pretty obvious. And if there isn't a relevant accounting standard, look at the conceptual framework and derive accounting practices which are consistent with the framework 
or with other accounting standards. Now, it's impossible to say that we need to be consistent all the time. There are going to be circumstances where we need to change accounting policies. The general rule is we want consistency, but businesses change, circumstances change, and regulations change. When accounting standards change, quite obviously you're going to have to change accounting practices. So we can't prohibit changes in accounting practices. However, what we can do is we can ensure that if you do change accounting practices, accounting policies, then you must provide a reason for the change, identify the change, reason for the change, and the effect of the change. So the reasons for the change are given, and the requirements for quite comprehensive disclosure are built into the standard. Finally, the standard which also the last standard which supports the framework is IS10 events after reporting period, and that's been issued in Australia as AASB 110. In terms of making our lives much easier, well, it's probably fair to say that all of the items addressed in this chapter could have been addressed quite comfortably in chapter three. So the lot belongs to chapter three, and it's really just defining that financial reports are for a period, not a period and the thereafter. So what's it doing? Well, effectively what IS 10 is doing is it's identifying the financial year end as a wall. And you have things which are inside the wall, which are pre-existing events, events which occurred or existed before year end, and they're described as adjusting events. Then you have things which are outside the wall, after year end. And if something happens after year end, subsequent to year end, then it's a non-adjusting item. The general principle is that when it comes to adjusting items, adjusting events, we recognize them in the financial statements. However, for non-adjusting items, they shouldn't be recognized in the financial reports. However, that doesn't mean to say they shouldn't be disclosed, and they should be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. So those are three accounting standards that I wanted you to read and to try and understand them. Please read them, having regard to what's already been read in the conceptual framework, and in combination after you've read these standards and taken away these major points. I think it's going to get you used to reading accounting standards first, and second, it's going to encourage you to think about accounting standards holistically and see how they operate in combination. Finally, it's going to get you thinking about reading what are the substantive requirements of standards, and then reading the supporting paragraphs and thinking about them separately.